Occasionally, we're privileged to examine the craft of one of the acknowledged leaders of a generation. Tonight, as we reach the midway point of our 12th year, is such a night. Our guest has made us look at ourselves and laugh at ourselves in an array of films from Robin Hood, Men in Tights, to Getting In, The Nutty Professor, Con Air, Half-Baked, You've Got Mail, Blue Streak, and Undercover Brother. In television, he has brought his unique, hilarious perspective to Deaf Comedy Jam, Comic Relief, frequent guest appearances wherever comedy counts, and in his live concert performances, Killing Them Softly, For What It's Worth, and Dave Chappelle's Block Party. The groundbreaking show that bears his name has been honored with Emmy and Image Award nominations and broken every record for DVD sales of a television show. The Actors Studio is very proud to welcome Dave Chappelle. Everybody's waiting to see how crazy I am. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> for 11 and a half years, my job on this stage has been to trace for our students the journey that has resulted in the artist in that chair at this moment. It begins always logically at the beginning. I'm sorry for What you didn't know is that I'm really funny. <laughs> He appreciates me. Sometimes you don't. He does. Oh. Where were you born, Dave? Washington, D.C. What's, what's your father's name? William David Chappelle. And your mother's? Yvonne Reed Chappelle. What were they doing in Washington when you were born? How did you happen to be there? I have no idea. I know sex was involved. And then, uh, <laughs> somehow, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what were my, you know, it's funny. My mom and my dad are very educated people. My dad was doing some corporate. I think he was doing statistics. In the course of this series, we've constructed an honor roll of impressive mothers. My research has indicated to me that your mother belongs in that number. She's going to love this. <laughs> but I think she deserves that. I do, too. What's her educational background? She's got a master's in divinity, a PhD in African American studies, and something else about some sociology. She's <laughs> she's got a stack of degrees in in the house somewhere. Didn't she have a career in the Congo when Patrice Lumumba? Yes, yeah, she worked for Lumumba. Uh, he hired her himself, and she worked there during the Civil War. She was there when he was when he was assassinated. What did your mother do when she returned to the United States? She opened the the Bolinga Center at the uh, Central State University. This was in uh, Ohio? Yeah, in Ohio. My research indicates that she established what may have been the first PhD program in black studies in 1974. Yeah. She was a pioneer. Yeah, she was, and in a lot of ways, I think she still is. You may know or may not know, she taught Lingala. That I didn't know. <laughs> it's a Congo language. She taught it at Central State University. Did she share any of her linguistic gifts with you? I barely speak English. <laughs> <laughs> Your father also had an academic career. Yes. Where did he teach? Antioch College. It's in Yellow Springs, Ohio. It's a real, like, hippie town. It's a hippie college. It's the hippie college. Yes, it is. Antioch, if you'll remember, is the school that had the sex policy. Ask every step of the way. May I kiss your breast? Did you have any siblings? I have two. I have a brother and a sister. Where'd you go to elementary school? Woodland Elementary, Silver Spring, Maryland. With an academic environment at home, how did you do in elementary school? Very poorly. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I never liked school from the first day. I just walked in there and said, I, I hate this place. I hate its guts. <laughs> I hated school. And I, I know it's not good to say to students. <laughs> but the way my mom introduced me to school was kind of traumatic because she didn't tell me I was going. 
she was packing a lunchbox and all this stuff was happening, and I thought we was going for a walk. <laughs> and then we walked into school, and she was like, I'm bouncing. <laughs> I was just in there. And uh, I cried, man, I cried. <laughs> and um, these kids were just so mean and evil. I don't know if people remember their first day of kindergarten, but it was like, I felt like all these kids had met each other before, and I was the only one that didn't know anybody. I got in a fight. This kid, I still remember his name, Paul. We were coloring him. He was coloring corn green. That really bugged me. <laughs> and I told him that corn was yellow, and he started hitting me, and I was like, this is the coldest shit that's ever happened to me in my life. It was just like instantly life had changed. So color was already an issue. Color was an issue. <laughs> you, you guys heard it? <laughs> yeah. Did television play a role in your life when you were a kid? I watched an incredible amount of television. Before I could tell time from a clock, I would tell it from a television. <laughs> that I could turn on the TV and say, oh, this is on, it's 7.30. <laughs> I watched so much TV, man. I was always like a escapist. Yeah. You know, I was that. I was the odd kid out. Like, uh, I didn't tell you this about my first day in kindergarten. I I peed in the nap time. I peed, <laughs> which instantly set me apart from everybody. <laughs> like, you can't do that. Right. But uh, but we were having juice. It got so good to me, and then I wasn't. <laughs> And uh, my older brother was like freakishly good looking dude, you know. Uh, me, I mean, I'm all right. <laughs> but you know, everyone in my family was light complected, except for me. And I'm telling you, from a young age, I noticed people were treating me different. But I didn't understand why they would treat me different. Yeah. And I do believe to this day that that has something to do with it. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you're not allowed to do on this show is to fake tears. All right, all right, I'm sorry. This is inside the actor's studio. We don't fake tears here. <laughs> still fake. <laughs> what middle school did you go to, Dave? Arthur E. Morgan Middle School, which no longer exists. And that's in uh, Yellow Springs. It was, uh, I guess, right after my last year in elementary school, my mom moved us, like before we lived right, right on the outskirts of Washington, on the dividing line. Yeah. Then mom moved us in the Northwest. We moved to DC, man, and it was like, the neighborhood was wild, and it, I was just at that age where I would want to start running the streets, right. so to speak. So my mom sent my brother and I to live with my father in, in Yellow Springs. I see. 4,500 people. May, maybe now there's like 3,700 people in that town. So, And all of them slightly different from the rest of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a hippie town. My yeah. dad at the time was involved in some, like, human rights group that was dedicated to ending racism. But it's a small town, so racism is a relative term. Hating black <laughs> people would mean I hate like 25 people I in this town. I guess. You know what I mean? It was <laughs> How old were you when your parents separated? My parents split up when I was two. And uh, I don't remember them married. What high school did you attend in Washington? Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Well, first, first I went to Eastern High School for half of a school year. I transferred to Duke Ellington. See, this is the thing. When I, when I came back from Ohio, like I left when I was like 10, almost 11. I came back when I was 13, going on 14. While I was gone, crack had come out. <laughs> so I got like a before and after. It was like a crack bomb had gone off. Like, <laughs> like DC during the crack epidemic was probably one of the worst cities in America, definitely was the murder capital. My freshman year of high school, 
560 kids my age murdered. It's heavy, man. You know, everybody I knew sold cracks. Only God knows how many people were smoking crack. And uh, that made a real big impression on me. That and the fact that D.C. is a very segregated city, uh, especially at that time. Statistically speaking to this day, statistically speaking, there's not one poor white person in Washington. There's a lot of poor black people in Washington. So these are the things that I'm seeing. And uh, I didn't like that shit, man. I didn't like going to Easton. <laughs> so I was going through a, a real tough time, man, like just readjusting. And uh, my mom bought me this Time magazine with Bill Cosby on the cover, Cosby Inc. Me and the guy had a lot of stuff in common, like some of the quotes he would say. And I just remember, like after reading that stuff, I put it down. And it was like, I'm going to be a comedian. And man, I'm telling you, I could see it so clearly. So clearly, man. This is, this is it. I was so excited. I told my family, I have an announcement to make. I'm going to be a comedian. You know, it was like real. Because <laughs> I was always funny. I'm the youngest kid. You know, the youngest kid in the family usually plays that role of the tension breaker. Right. I was that dude, and uh, that's when my mom suggested that maybe I go to a comedy club and check it out. Live comedy is the most incredible thing in the world to me. Like the first time you see a dude just standing there talking, and every joke he's saying just hitting, it was working. And every weekend I would go, I'd get a little money, and to the point they started knowing me, I, I'd just sit in the crowd and I'd just be watching. And then on Tuesdays, they had an open mic. And I go on Tuesdays to see why people weren't working. Weekends were to see why people were working. Tuesday, I was figuring out what's wrong with these people. <laughs> to watch a comedian bomb is, is, is one of the greatest things <laughs> in the world. I love it. And then at that point, I was talking to a comedian after one of the shows. and. Uh, and the owner of the comedy club, and they were both saying, you know, if you want to be a good comedian, you got to take acting classes. And they didn't explain it. But after that, I went home and I said, Mom, I got to take acting classes. And that's how the Duke Ellington thing started. That's a school of the arts, right? Yeah. And what did you study there? Theater. The school was incredible. Classical acting, modern acting, improvisation, technical theater, script analysis, uh, script writing. Did you work while you were at, in school in Washington? Yeah, okay. Let's run down the list. <laughs> My first job, <laughs> summer, between 87 and 88 school year. <laughs> now, this is a tradition. The first person in the 11 and a half years of this series who ever smoked on stage was Sean Penn, and the students applauded him then. Tonight, you light up a cigarette, the students say, what do you got about cigarettes? You like cigarettes? Uh, you applaud when you smoke. I don't know about y'all, but this shit is stressing me out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm confessing and stuff. Does everything feel like I'm on trial in this <laughs> Tell me about that thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I was a child and Tulsa Wild, Mr. Lipton. All right, so, uh, all right, the first job, then remember, this is when it, people were making a lot of money selling drugs. $3.50 an hour. August, I had to dress up in a cookie costume. <laughs> Not bullshitting, a cookie costume <laughs> with chocolate chips and a big chocolate chip on my head. <laughs> sweating. And I had to hand out flyers for this place called the Cookie, cookie Bag. <laughs> when I started at Duke Ellington, it was like you go to school from, from uh, eight, 8 o'clock in the morning till at least 5 o'clock at night. So work stopped for a while. And then, you know, that nightclub thing kicked in. Was your early comedy autobiographical? Still don't talk about myself. It isn't. Mm, it's yes, but never directly. I don't want to give away my secret recipe. 
<laughs> but originally my plan was I'll go to school and then after I graduate, I'll start stand up. But then I was like, I'm going to the club after school. It's Tuesday, so I'm gonna go to that open mic night. I had been practicing with the candlestick in the mirror. I felt like I was ready. And I told my family I was going. I told my mom, you know, I'm going. I don't want you to come. I'm gonna go by myself. It's something I gotta do and whatever, whatever. So of course she shows up <laughs> with my grandmother <laughs> and, and my brother. The MC introduced me. I can remember the introduction. You know, folks, everybody's got to start sometime. And tonight is this young man's first time on stage. Who knows? This is exactly what it says. Who knows? You may be witnessing the birth of a star. Please welcome Dave Chappelle. <laughs> and I went up there, man, and I was scared. And I used to look at my feet when I started. And I said the first joke, looking out of my feet, and they laughed. And then I looked up, like, holy. <laughs> and then I looked back down at my feet and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and after the set, you know, the crowd was going crazy. I think I did two and a half minutes, but they were going crazy. I was 14, probably looked like I was 11. Jesus. I was telling jokes about Jesse Jackson running for president and Alf spaceship landing in a black neighborhood. Because <laughs> before I got on, I was scared, and I told my grandmother, like, you might hear me say some things that you might not want to hear your grandson say. And she said, just relax and do that shit. I said, whoa. <laughs> I never heard it come. So it went, it went great. And then here's the kicker. So then I go to school the next day, you know, feeling like a million bucks, and I go and I'm telling all the kids at school, guess what I did last night? Comedy club. Ripped, the crowd was going crazy, you know. And you know what they said? Cool. And it was the beginning of a dual life. By day, I was Clark Kent. <laughs> and at night, I was Superman, you know. Pretty girl in school might look at me and be like, oh, Dave, he's so funny, but I wouldn't date him. But at night, I'd date women your mother's age, if I wanted to. <laughs> Did you move to New York to do some stuff? Yeah. Well, I said, I'm going to go to that Apollo and rip that mug. <laughs> I went for the regular Wednesday amateur night. When I say I got booed off stage, God. I, I, I still remember that boo. I'd never been booed off stage before. But I just remember looking out and seeing like everybody, boo, everybody. <laughs> Even old people, I was like, who, who boos a child pursuing his dreams? <laughs> like, this is the, the meanest crowd in the world. And that sign went off, and that dude comes out tap dancing. Dun, 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 San dun, dun, Sandman. Sandman, I wanted to choke the shit out, I hate you. <laughs> And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Why? Best thing, because before that time, I had never bombed, let alone got booed off stage. And bombing was horrifying. Nobody wants to bomb. Nobody, that's, you know, when people say you do comedy, what happens if nobody laughs? I don't know. <laughs> so that night was liberating because I failed so far beyond my wildest nightmares of failing that it was like, hey, they're all booing. My friends are here watching, my mom. This is not that bad. <laughs> and after that, I was fearless. To get into the New York comedy circuit, it's a very closed circuit. And I, I got in all these clubs in like a week, two weeks. Like, that's just reputation. Have you seen this kid? Have you seen this kid? I was like, that dude. How old were you when you made your first TV development deal? 19. My mother and my grandmother were freaked out. You know, I was the first person in my family not to go to college that had not been a slave. Right. <laughs> so I was really breaking from tradition. And uh, it was like a graduation lunch we were having. And they had my dad come and talk to me. And my dad takes me outside. And he's like, listen, and this is some advice that applies to all you acting students. He says, to be an actor, is a lonely life. Everybody wants to make it, and you might not make it. And I said to my dad, well, well, that depends on what making it is, Dad. 
smart, smart ass kid. Yeah. Depends on what making it is there. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a teacher. I said, if I can make a teacher's salary doing comedy, I think that's better than being a teacher. And he started laughing. He said, if you keep that attitude, I think you should go. He said, but name your price in the beginning. If it ever gets more expensive than the price you name, get out of there. Mm -hmm. Thus, Africa. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, oh, you guys are going to learn a lot tonight. What can they learn? You know, like, you guys are students now, so you're idealists, but you don't know about where art and corporate interests meet yet. Just prepare to have your heart broken. <laughs> like, in a way, <laughs> you see them laughing at evil laugh? <laughs> <laughs> Because he knows, man, and everybody laughs at me, but just get your Africa tickets ready, baby, because it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. You, you have no idea. The first pilot I did was called I'm the Man, and, and it, it didn't get picked up. It was real painful, because I had experienced nothing but success. Took it like a bitch, man. I was really upset. <laughs> and that's when I started Smoking that weed, man, it just made me feel better, man. I'm not trying to tell kids to do that. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't tell anybody to do it, but that's, why I was, that's how I dealt with my problems. And at the time, it was working out great, baby. I was <laughs> smoking that weed. <laughs> man, I'm just being real, you know. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of white kids, you got things accessible to you, like uh, therapy. We don't have that. We have liquor stores and weed. <laughs> You've called The Nutty Professor one of your favorite film assignments. Why? I just remember the first day at work, and I'm walking on the set, and I'm, this fat dude comes up, like, hey, man, you're real funny. I'm like, thanks. Oh, was, yeah, Eddie Murphy. He had that makeup on, and he knew my jokes. He started telling obscure jokes I did, like he knew them. And every day we would do takes, man. I mean, somewhere this footage exists. And when they say cut, I mean, those extras would be cheering. I mean, it was like me and Eddie, would, we would dance. And Eddie would drop these jewels on me, you know, when we're working. He, he's a real wise dude. He's seen a lot of Eddie Murphy. And he was the guy that was like, you got to start writing. He was like, the way you tell jokes, you, you think in pictures. And you can write. You should start doing it. And that was the big nutty professor breakthrough. In The Nutty Professor, Dave plays a severely manic comic named Reggie Warrington, who uses his comic skills to humiliate Eddie Murphy as the hapless Sherman Klump. <laughs> a lesson for this evening, comedy can be cruel. <laughs> Somewhere there's a black professor watching this like buffoonery. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that made me laugh seeing that because I remember when I said who would suck at whose titties land and Eddie was like doing the Sherman and he was drinking and then I said it and water shot out of his nose <laughs> and he said, he said I'm sorry I'm sorry I wasn't expecting that and that was the best feeling like to make Eddie Murphy break characters was very to this day man forget the Emmy nomination that was like that was the best who wrote Half Baked It was uh, me and Neil and Purple Haze. <laughs> Tell us about that writing process. Uh... <laughs> How did you guys work? I can't remember. I was high, man. I was like, <laughs> the night before we had these series of pitch meetings, we were like, man, we don't have a story. And at the time, you know, I drank a little beer, so we drank some beer. Neil doesn't smoke weed. I smoke weed some weed. And suddenly, 
we had this story, this weird story about <laughs> killing a police horse and needing to raise money. And it was really weird the way it happened, man. But it was really inspired, half baked. I liked smoking weed so much that I thought I should make a movie about this. <laughs> <laughs> And it was inspired, man. It was like, you know, it was inspired. When that script came out, me and Neil, me and Neil we were hot as a pistol for a week. It was, the script was way better than the movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was, that script was dope. <laughs> Dave, who do you play in the movie? Huh? I played Thurgood Jenkins. Thurgood Jenkins. Yes. But that's only half the story. Who else do you play in the movie? Oh, I play the Sir Smoke a Lot. <laughs> one of my favorite scenes <laughs> is the one that involves both Thurgood and Sir Smoke a Lot. <laughs> Very embarrassing, homie. So I think it's a remarkable piece of acting. That's why I wanted to play it. I'm sorry, man. For me, it's a little surreal being on the actor's studio and just to see you like, and then you did half baked. <laughs> when Martin Lawrence was in that chair, we talked about Blue Streak. I love that. Dude. He played a role in your life, I believe. How do you feel about him as a person, as an artist? Martin Lawrence is the guy that showed everybody you can make it from DC to Hollywood. And uh, I had a personal stake in his success. Every time he did something, it made me feel inspired and really good. And he was always real nice to me. He'd sit me down, what's going on with you, baby boy? What, what? We'd talk about comedy, whatever. And, uh, you know, when we did Blue Streak, we were promoting it, you know, and Martin had a stroke. He almost died. And then after that, I saw him, and I was like, oh my God, Martin, are you okay? And he said, I got the best sleep I ever got in my life. That's how tough he is. So let me ask you this. What is happening in Hollywood that a guy that tough will be on the street waving a gun, screaming, they are trying to kill me? Yeah. What's going on? Why is Dave Chappelle going to Africa? Why does Mariah Carey make a $100 million deal and take her clothes off on TRL? It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. There ain't no weak people talking to you. So what is happening in Hollywood? Nobody knows. The worst thing to call somebody is crazy, is dismissive. I don't understand this person, so they're crazy. That's bullshit. These people are not crazy, they're strong people. Maybe the environment is a little sick. dropping dimes tonight. <laughs> I've had a long year, Mr. Lipton. We're on our way. What did you mean, Dave, when you described your father's death in 1998 as the beginning of a terrible decline? I was 23 when I was doing Half Baked. I was getting ready to turn 24. And I was going through all the things that a dude goes through when he goes from one level to the next. I was yeah. starring in my, a movie that I wrote so things start getting crazy around you. Yeah. And my 24th birthday was coming on August the 24th, and I said, this is going to be a big one. And the morning that I turned 24, phone rang, and my sister was like, Dad had a stroke. For the next year, I watched my father teeter on life and death. And it was just all this sh stuff, man. Like I was, uh, dad was dying, the half-baked didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. I was real upset about that. Because it was a real cool script. And then I saw it, I was like, hey, man, you made a weed movie for kids. <laughs> and it wasn't for kids a script, you know. It was all these things, so much pressure. Africa. Then I, um, <laughs> 
I was in Ohio. I get a call on my cell phone from Hollywood. I'm like, hello, Hollywood. They're like, hello, Dave. <laughs> They're like, that pilot you did for Fox, the, looks like they want to pick it up. We need you to come out because they want to meet with you. And I was like, well, listen, I can't really come out right now. I've got a real bad situation at home. Can we talk about this on the phone? No, no, they would rather meet with you in person. Huh? But you know, like the whore that they turned us into, I jumped on that plane and left my father's bedside, which I regret to this day. And I went out and I sat with these people in this room. And if you can imagine a large circle people, and I was 12 o'clock, the black dude. Yeah, Dave, we really liked the show, but the, the pilot episode was about me getting booed off stage at the Apollo. They go, you know, but what are we going to do about it? I mean, there's not really any white people in it. I said, well, it's about the Apollo. It's not really white. Well, you know, we were thinking about the girl on the show. We didn't think she was that funny, not that good looking. I think we should recast her, maybe. And they start using terms like universal appeal. Mm -hmm. Basically saying they want me to recast the girl with a white woman. I say, yeah, I don't think I can do this. and and and. I quit. On the cover of Variety, Chappelle pulls the race card. The race card. And I get calls from Newsweek, 60 Minutes. Everybody, we want your story. <laughs> Man, I'm scared to death. I'm like Rosa Parks or some <laughs> Like, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> I was just bitten a little bit. And then, a few months later, dad dies. And that's hard for a young dude in his life. That's a, that's a real tough loss. I was there when he died. And he went from being my father to what are we going to do with the body? Within moments, it was over. And I'm going through all this stuff, and this is the guy I would usually talk to, right? Dad, now I got to figure this out for myself. I don't want to figure this out for myself. You know, I was beat down. I wasn't living right. You know what I mean? Like, the weed thing was just bad habit at this point, and and. You know what I mean? All these, you know, chicken head girls you mess with when it comes with the territory. I'm just being real. Just being real. <laughs> it wasn't living right, man. I didn't feel good. And, and the stand-up stuff was just some angry stuff. It was just like I was kind of bottoming out. But when my dad died, because I'd been commuting back and forth to Ohio so much, that's when I bought the farm, which I called on the you Hollywood farm. Did you stay in Yellow Springs for a while? I'm, I live there to this day. I, go, I, I live there to this day. I'm raising my kids there. Look, man, at, at that point in your life, it, it's something so real in contrast to what Hollywood is, a very powerful illusion. And when your dad dies, it kind of just broke the spell. Like, oh, this is bullshit. Look, I've been spending so much time doing this. What about my family? What about my friends? Wait, whatever happened to my friends? Damn, I don't even have any friends. Ugh. So I bounced, man. And, uh, New Year's Eve, 1999, I, I moved into that farm, and that was it. As far as I was concerned, I was done with show business. The comedians I've worked with over the years often don't laugh at jokes. Can you be amused by your own work, by other people's work? I love my jokes. <laughs> Good. Some jokes like, you know, you know, I got this real immature streak where I write a lot of scatological humor. So I've heard. You know. Uh, but a good joke will just never... It just, they last, they hold up. <laughs> I just like having fun. When I'm on stage, I get real happy up there. Like, maybe that's the only time in my adult life that I feel like myself. You're standing up there. You know what I mean? Like a gladiator. And them lights is on you, and you look down, and everyone's looking up at you like. <laughs> and it's just all these smiles around you, and, and they get dressed, and they put perfume on and stuff, and they're going to see your show. That feels good, man. These people, you know, they love you. Even if it's for a minute, they really do. They, they love you, man. You know, it's like a, it's a love fest. Good feeling. Yeah, it's the best feeling, man. I love stand-up. In 2000, you taped a concert for HBO. Yes. Called Killing Them Softly. Killing Them Softly. <laughs> to borrow a comedian's term of art, Dave killed in that concert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the way the setup for this is that is that his limo driver says he's got to stop somewhere, so he stops in the ghetto, and it's Dave in the ghetto in a limo. Yes, yes. Huh? He gets it. <laughs> he gets it. That's it. But the thing is that you 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 do exactly what a, what a honky would do in the ghetto. You put the <laughs> you put the. That you lock the doors, exactly right? right? So you have ambivalent feelings. You're both, you're drawn to it and you're... And I'm afraid. Listen, man. <laughs> Black people don't like the ghetto. <laughs> like you and me, you mean. Yeah. Don't nobody, you know, nobody wants to live in the ghetto, but the joke is so dope. Man, I got...